I have a very specific outcast question. So um, I want you to talk about the differences in working with uh, between Dre and, and Big Boy. I really study, Big Boy is somebody that I really look at and I look at a lot of the moves in his career and they seem to be a direct reflection of you know you know his relationship with you so i want to know he talks he's always spoken very highly of you and yeah his, man i love him you know so I mean? much yeah so like how have you how's that relationship between those two guys uh over the years how's that developed uh it, it's always been really good and and the truth is i think it might have been one of my better relationships because i didn't know their music as well like like i couldn't tamper do you know what i mean mm -hmm. like if tlc makes a record i have a very strong opinion about it or or anybody you know uh, usher makes a record i have a very strong opinion about it but with outcast they were such they were such originals that if they felt passionately about it my job was to be a servant leader instead of being wow. uh instead of meddling I have a question. Okay, am I the only one that thinks this, Fonte? As much as I love elevators. Okay. Dude, in 1996, to make your first single a very slow tempo song that's like 88 BPMs, not, not conducive to what I believe dance culture was. But in that was in the South, though. That, Atlanta. That was yeah, that was Atlanta. a risky song. Right. That was such yeah. a risky song. In the yo. South for us, man, that was not our shit. It wasn't risky for us. We ran the fuck out of elevators like immediately. Like because when I got way. like by that point, I was like getting serviced by DJs and whatnot. And yes, as a as an as a northeasterner, like I was I was in the groove of where hip hop was in that period between like ninety two BPMs and hundred BPMs, like very fast pit and. When I put elevators on, I just stared at the record like, yo, this is so yes. slow and spacey. Yeah. How am I going to wake, make this work in my DJ sets? And yet y'all went with it. Like there was no fear whatsoever. I actually didn't know one way or another. Like, to be honest with you, right? Andre and Big Boy and Rico Wade, they came to the office and they were like, this is it. This is it. This is it. And I knew Andre. What I did know is that that Andre verse was... Oh. We all knew that. I yeah. mean, that was like seriously, like, damn, he's good. He's really good. Um, but as a song, I probably had the same opinion you did. I was like, this is a little slow. It's not that clear either, you know. Like, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't sparkling. It was dark, <laughs> right? And um, so I had the same. But but I really believed in. I really believed in Rico Wade. Like Rico Wade was the leader. Um, and, and and he was he was my ears my my eyes and my ears to to everything that that we were doing in that world of of outcast the goody mob um uh, and even you know who parental advisory is yes you know, oh, yeah pa absolutely pa right they were they were in the crew as well so i just listened to rico and it worked and after it worked my relationship with them was you guys make your own decisions. I, if you want my opinion, I'll give you my opinion, but I'm not giving you my opinion unless you ask me. Is you, that still your relationship with Big Boy now? Because y'all still, yeah. like, work. it's still. To this day, yeah. That's amazing. I do what he says. <laughs> okay, so without Rico's presence on speaker box, how do you trust your instincts? I mean, by this point, they're, they're now a marquee act. They're your A-listers, and without the muscle of of organized noise sort of under them. I mean, even though they're there, right? Somewhat. How shaky was it to navigate a double album of clearly two different sides, right? And not only make it work, but make it one of their most and and to take them on stage. I was there that night. I couldn't believe that shit. Like they actually, so how much, how hard, not hard, or how worrisome were you to like go with your gut being the, I'm, I'm assuming that you're now manning the ship for at least that album. Yes. That you didn't have yes. to go there to guide you. Right. So things that kind of changed, they really grew into their, they really had grown into it. I mean, this was after Stankonia 
mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. and which was a massive success for them. Um, and I mean, the real story was it was Big Boy's solo album, mm-hmm. right? And it was complete. And it was it was done. And and I heard um, I like the way you move. So I felt confident that we had like a big single. Mm-hmm. And Andre called because they weren't working together. It's, I mean, this is fairly common yeah. knowledge, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. They yeah. weren't working together. And Andre called the office. Reed, when are you dropping Big Boy's album? I gave him the date. He's like, <clears throat> so if I want to drop an album with that, how much time do I have? And I think I told him you got three weeks. He was like, three weeks. Ah. Okay. What? <laughs> Wait. So I don't know, know this story. Oh. Yeah. Where was he in the process? Just, what, okay. songs? I, what? I didn't what? know what he had recorded because he wasn't really talking about it at all. He wasn't talking about making a record. Big Boy was gone solo. We've already done a photo shoot. We've picked the single. We've put the date on the calendar. We're moving forward. And then I get that call from Andre. And he says, you know, how much time do I have? And that was the first time I had an indication that he wanted to make an album. We had not talked about it at all. And I told him three weeks. And I just remember him saying, ah, okay. And he hung up. He was probably done already. It had to so, be. Had to. All I remember is that on the night that we had to like turn the album in for parts so we could manufacture, mm-hmm. Andre has studios going everywhere. He had mastering going on. He had a couple of mix rooms going on. He had uh, he had an ensemble of studios going to make the deadline. He was working his ass off. I went to the studio to visit and um, heard some of the material, but uh, he finished it and sat down and played it for me. And I was, I could not believe what I was hearing, man. And, and he played me, Hey Ya. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my God. And, and I didn't try to say, I didn't try to go into the like, okay, yeah, this is a smash. That, that, that wasn't how I reacted. I was more blown away that you actually did this in three weeks. And I felt like you did like, yo, right, you must've had this. There's no way you did this in three weeks. Yeah, he did. And, he did. Monte and, has a theory, though. When Pete Rock was telling the story of how he made Public Enemies shut him down in 10 minutes. Oh, and yeah. And yeah. one of y'all said, like, because of the pressure, like, he didn't have time to overthink You're it. not thinking it. No, you just. Oh, yeah. 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 That's also Quincy. He tells about the, the, the alpha state. Like, he talks about that. Just Analysis, for, paralysis through analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yes. just going. You're not thinking about it. You're just creating. That's so right. you you were actually you were presented with this scenario twice. And I always wanted to know how far did TLC get and in going with that initial thing where I believe Lisa suggested all three of us should make solo records. And oh, oh um not very far. Okay. <laughs> Honestly, not very far at all. Uh because T Boz had made a couple of solo songs that for a soundtrack. I gotta remember the soundtrack. Yeah, the kids thing. I touched myself record. Uh, well, I touched myself. That's the song. You're right. That was I remember that. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking about the uh that rug Rex thing, but no, that was that would have been after. But okay. so she did it, and it was pretty clear to me that it was the ensemble that was the magic, right? And mm-hmm. I love t Boz. Like, I mean, I loved all of them, but I had a particular love for her style, that raspy voice, her kind of, her, the, she kind of approached it like a guy. She was the only girl I've seen approach it like a guy, but, but, uh, and I just, th- I thought she was so dope. Um, but it was the ensemble that was the, the, the real winner there. And then Lisa made a solo album uh, before she passed away, um, may right. she rest in peace. I miss her so much. Um, she made a solo album and, uh, I, I wasn't blown away by it. I didn't think it was incredible mm-hmm. at all, you know, and it was, and it was, it was the kind of music I, sh- I, I should, ha- I should have loved it. 
if it were good. It wasn't like outside of my thing. The way I sort of describe Goody Mob as right. outside of my thing. So I got to defer to them. This wasn't outside of my sweet spot, but I just didn't think it was great. Yeah. And uh, Chili never actually tried to make a solo record that I can remember uh, until many, many years later. Uh, so okay. that one didn't get that one didn't go very far. How did you balance, you know, a record like Crazy Sexy Cool, where it's on your label, but you're also writing and producing? <laughs> I didn't you write know, and produce on it. You didn't do yeah, that wasn't you and Babyface together, like on no, no. I that was when that was the last time uh that I was a, a writer producer was uh seven whole days, Tony Braxton. Ah, okay, okay. That gotcha. was the last time. And after and I did, and then I did a song that never made never saw the light of day with um Elton John that Elton called and asked me to produce. Oh, wow. Right. Um, and it was for a um a Curtis Mayfield tribute record it wasn't commercial at all. Elton yeah. was spending time in Atlanta for a minute. I was like, "Were you the reason yeah, that Elton, Elton was, was spending in Atlanta time a lot?" Yeah, uh, but I stopped. I, I stopped, yeah. and uh, Kenny and I stopped working together. And I started spending too much time on the phone. I was transitioning into being an executive. I was I was learning how to how independent promotion worked. I was learning how marketing worked and I was so intrigued with the stuff I didn't know. And people were coming in and telling me about like Janet Jackson's marketing plan. I was like, what's a marketing plan? So I got became curious about everything. And, and I was hearing words like they shipped a hundred thousand. What's that mean? Shipped a hundred thousand. Yeah. I, I just became curious about the business and, uh, and I, I think I sort of fell out of love with producing and writing and i was never a great writer kenny was a great writer i was a good producer but kenny was a great writer and i was a collaborator and i filled in some blanks and had some concepts here and there but he was the great writer uh so it was easy to, to sort of step back because i didn't consider myself great at it in the first place i felt must i felt very lucky so with the the, the label where was that primarily you running the label and face just doing the music or was he involved on the label side as well no i think if you ask him he would say that he's always said that the label was kind of my thing gotcha right mm -hmm. uh because i like the idea of signing talent and doing all that stuff you know and picking songs and so you know. for so for a record like a crazy sexy cool where you know baby face is doing uh like a dig it on you or whatever right yes is there no conflict of interest I actually had all of the producers competing and they didn't really know it. <laughs> <laughs> like I had, I had Dallas working on it first. He was the architect. Then I'd go play it for Jermaine Dupri and be like, I know you could beat this. And then I did his piece. <laughs> and then I, you know, and then Kenny is competitive. You don't have to, you don't have to put a battery in Kenny's back. He's so competitive. So he sent his songs in. And then I went to Rico Wade last and said, here's what everybody else gave me. What you got? And he came up with Waterfalls. Wow. wow. Right. So, uh, and so according to, according to uh, executives at Arista, outside of uh, Outkast, they considered Crazy Sexy Cool my first time as an a and r executive mm -hmm. that i i wasn't the writer i wasn't the producer uh and that was that's and so I, if it was my first i didn't see it that way but if it was i did okay and with I no input so from i'm sorry lay like, i wouldn't that was, that oh was, and with with no input from clive at all like uh hey, oh maybe. yeah clive, clive not once it was done clive had opinions about the singles and uh and we had you know creep was the first single i love creep by the way yeah, mm -hmm. that's but that's um cool. so we shot a video for creep wasn't very good huh? it's like damn so we shot a second video for creep oh again wasn't very good i'm like fuck now i'm in Wait, trouble what yeah we shot two videos and they weren't good the, the, the world never saw them yeah and so i was embarrassed so i switched singles i said Creep's no longer the single. We're going to go with this song called Kick Your Game that Jermaine Dupri did. Oh, Clive was like, hold it, hold it, hold it. Why are you changing singles? 
<laughs> what is this? What's behind this? You have to explain, right? And Dallas Austin called like, yo, I know you're not like not putting my single out. Like he knew he had a great record. Uh -huh. And so I had to come clean and say, well, truth be told, like I made two horrible videos and I'm just too embarrassed to tell everybody. <laughs> so Clive says, get it right. He said, get it right. So I'm sitting with Diddy one day at the uh, at the Helmsley Palace Hotel in New York. I'm sitting with Diddy. I play him the TLC video that's not good. And he looks at me and he's like, oh my God, like, oh, this is horrible. And he, I don't, he does not make me feel any better about it, right? <laughs> but while I'm showing him the video on one television, because I used to have this road case that I carried around with speakers and monitor mm -hmm. and everything, of like office in a case, I was extra. While I'm playing it for him, on the television, there's a video with um, In Vogue and Salt and Pepper called What a Man, What a Man. What a man. Mm -hmm. And Matthew. I look at that video, it looks way better than our video. I'm like, who directed that? It's Matthew, Matthew Ralston. Yeah. So I called Matthew Ralston and I asked him to do uh, Creep. And we got it right the third time. But we threw Man. two videos away to get to, now, to the good one. I will do anything to find those original videos. In a situation like that, though, when, when TLC got to repay the money back, do they got to pay for all three of those versions or do they just pay for the one that made it? Well, uh, let's look at it like this. You sell 10 million albums. Okay. They don't, okay. <laughs> there you go, sir. Uh, I don't okay. know. Yeah. I, I was, if you want the truth, I don't know. I love it. That's all I wanted to hear. That's, That's how I got my ass in fine. trouble because I, I didn't know. know. Like, you know, I'm so busy like <laughs> trying to make the great record, trying to make the great video. I'm, like, I'm spending okay. people's money and not realizing. Yes. It, you know, I yo, I'm I'm seething with anger right now. I love your honesty. I love your honesty. I'm seething with anger because to sit in the Geffen offices and be told your videos are one and done, like there is no going back, like. I can't believe that I'm hearing stories of we Everything didn't like happens the video, for a reason. It's so okay. We'll take Amir. it back and then we'll take it back again. And then it's we'll okay. take it back. I hear Mariah made four videos for Vision of Love. And that's I'm a like, very old school thing, though, man. Like, that's so no, old. but I mean, yeah. it's just our label convinced us that, like, because we hated our videos. And right. like, wow. And you couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. Like, you were stuck. Either yeah. video or no video. Like, Oh my God. I and those roots videos weren't too memorable. <laughs> That's why I hate making videos. Weird enough. Hey man, she's being mean to you. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Like, your videos are not too memorable. That's mean. Listen. You say that. <laughs> the reason that I am here is because I'm the roots largest fan. So I can say a couple of truthful things. I'm here. Okay, for all right. All right. 